Yeah, and then you can just say, you know, welcome. We'll get started in a moment. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the National Biodiversity Teaching. Um, we'll start right away. If you have any questions for the presenter, feel free to place it in the Q&A box. So hi, welcome to the final week of the National Biodiversity Teach-In. Um, we're Isabella and Emily, um, and we're here today with Frank Sladek, who is the Urban Fishing Coordinator for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Um, so whenever you're ready, Frank, you can go ahead. Absolutely. Well, first, I just want to thank you for inviting me and sharing this opportunity with me. I'm very excited to be here and very excited to be presenting. Um, I'm not going to look quite yet in the chat to see how many people are attending, but I talked to a coworker and they said uh, over 200 students had attended their presentation. So I hope we have a good turnout today. And I hope you learn a little bit something about uh, Illinois fisheries and kind of what we do here in the state and a little bit about me as well. So let's just jump right into it, and that way we'll have time for questions at the end. So just to get started here, uh, today we're going to be talking about some fishery fundamentals and also the importance of angler education, not only here in Illinois, but all around the world, uh, because a lot of states and countries operate similar when it comes to fisheries. So this doesn't just apply, this talk today doesn't just apply to Illinois, it actually applies to a lot of different states here in the US and countries around the world as well. Before we get into that though, let's talk a little bit about me real fast. Uh, one of the things that the presenters and the organizers of this event asked was to give a quick background about myself and kind of how I got here into this position. So I've held a lot of titles over the years. I've been an environmental educator and I still am. I'm a certified interpreter, which means I'm basically trained how to talk to people. And I also am a fishing instructor. Uh, now I'm a coordinator for that same program, but I started off my career as a fishing instructor and still am. I'm a zoologist and that's what my degrees are in. I have a bachelor's and a master's in zoology. I'm also a naturalist, so I study a little bit of everything, both plants, animals, and even fungi and other organisms as well. I'm also a mushroom hunter outside of work, and I'm a huge reptile nerd or enthusiast, whatever you want to call it. So uh, in my career, I've worked with probably over 250 species of animals, and that includes fish, reptiles, birds, insects. And if you look closely in this photo, you'll see them holding a little bat. I actually worked with bats for a summer as well, and that was a lot of fun. All right. So this is actually a picture of me a long time ago. I'm the guy in the green shirt in the back, and that's when I was actually a fishing instructor with our urban fishing program here in Illinois, which I'm now the coordinator of for the northern half of the state, but this is a long time ago, and this is actually one of my first summers with that program, and I was paid to teach kids how to go fishing and teach them about aquatic resources, uh, and I still do that to this day, so it's a lot of fun. I also worked at both zoos here in Chicago, so I was an interpreter at Lincoln Park Zoo, and I got to present a lot of different animals. You could see here that I have a little armadillo and she was trying to ball up on me. Uh, this armadillo's name was actually Meatball and she was one of our program animals. And then there's some meerkats here in the back kind of checking me out. Uh, but again, I worked at both zoos here in Chicago. So I was a zookeeper at Brookfield Zoo for a while as well. I was a naturalist in DuPage County. There's me with a little snapping turtle. Uh, here's a Northern water snake in the center. And then there's me and my coworker doing some muscle work and one of the streams in central Illinois. So we're actually digging our hands in the mud looking for freshwater mussels. Like I said before, I also like going out and taking pictures and hunting mushrooms. So these are some mushroom photos I've taken over the years in Illinois. And you can see there's a pretty wide variety, all different size, shapes, and colors. Uh, mushrooms are one of my favorite organisms. Really, really cool. And they serve a very important role in the ecosystem. Like I said before, I'm also a big reptile nerd. I've actually worked with probably over 100 species of reptiles in my career. Uh, these next couple slides are actually animals that I've kept as personal pets and used for educational programs. So this slide is all about my snakes. We've got some boa constrictors, 
We've got a little Asian rat snake there at the bottom, and they're very pretty. And then we have a indigo snake up here in the corner. And again, very gorgeous and very intelligent animals. Uh, these are some more of my pets from over the years. So we have a, a knoll over here from Cuba. We have a chuckwalla, which are from the southern U.S. or southwestern U.S. Uh, we have an Asian forest tortoise. And then we have a Cuban false chameleon up in the right. And like I said, I'm a huge reptile nerd. So these are some more reptiles I've worked with over the years. Uh, these are little crocodile skinks. They sort of look like toothless from How to Train Your Dragon. And then we have a endangered iguana here in the center. And then this is one of my favorite animals I've ever worked with. Uh, these are Vietnamese mossy frogs, and they actually have textured skin. So they look like moss. Really, really cool animals. Uh, and they make calls like a bird. Very, very loud, especially at four in the morning. Uh, <laughs> I forgot I had this many reptile slides, but this is all about the turtles. Uh, so we've got a snapping turtle. We've got some South American wood turtles. And then we've got here in the bottom, this is one of my rescued box turtles. Uh, and I actually have four of those right now. So yeah, I'm a huge reptile nerd, even though I work with fish. In fact, I was such... A reptile nerd and enthusiast that I actually ran a kids club here in Chicago for many years. And for a couple of years, I was actually show director for Reptile Fest, which is the largest educational reptile show in the United States. And I ran that for a couple of years right here in Chicago. Uh, we didn't do any live animal sales or anything like that. We did strictly educational programming and we had uh, over 500 animals on display each year. It was a lot of fun. But at the end of the day, I am a fisherman, and I always have been. Uh, this is actually a very nice trout that I caught a couple years ago. And I'm going to show you another photo. If you think this might be somewhere in a far off location or maybe a different country, I have another photo to show you. Check this out. That was right in downtown Chicago. And a lot of people don't know that we have these type of fish here in Illinois, let alone a big city like Chicago. But this was, in fact, right in downtown Chicago. And I've caught several fish like this over the years. We actually do have quite a diversity of fish here in the state. And I'm going to get into that here in just a minute. I like to call myself a lakefront lifer. I've been fishing for over 30 years since I was a little kid, and growing up just outside of Chicago, I love fishing Lake Michigan, and I've caught all sorts of different fish on the lake. I've caught everything from salmon and trout to bass, and this is kind of hard to see. It's a little bit blurry, but this is a very odd fish called an eel pout. They're very slimy. And they're very hard to hold. They're very slippery, uh, but they have this really cool spotted pattern. And these are native to the state. Uh, really, really neat fish. But my passion for fishing goes way back past my college days. And I especially like going after the toothy fish, which we have quite a few toothy fish right here in the state of Illinois. So this is a northern pike from right by Brookfield Zoo here in Chicago. Uh, this is actually down in Florida. That's a little bonnethead shark. And you can see a lot of sharp teeth in that little guy's mouth. This was right outside Chicago, again, right by Brookfield Zoo. This is a fish called a sauger, and they're a river fish. And then if we want to go way far back, <laughs> I've got a little collection here of photos growing up as a kid. And these are all me fishing. In fact, this one in the top left here was the same spot that I caught this fish right here just last year. Uh, but this is about 30 years ago. I was pretty little in this photo. So I've been fishing a long time. In fact, let's go a little bit further back even. This is where it all started. And I cannot stress this enough, and you're gonna hear more about this later in the presentation. Fishing is really the reason why I got into zoology and why I've been able to work with so many different animals over the years and do so much in my career. It's all because I started fishing when I was very young and I got exposed to the outdoors. And you're going to learn more about that later and why that's important for all the students that are listening in to get outside and experience this. Because without a fishing pole in my hand when I was three years old, I wouldn't have done nearly anything 
that I couldn't even imagine in this career. Uh, and that includes all the photos that you've seen and all the photos that you're going to see in the next half hour. All right, so let's jump right into it. So why fishing? And that is a question I get a lot uh, from students and adults. Why was fishing so important in my career path? And why is it important now and forever? I want you to take a quick look at this photo. And I want you to look at all that you see in this picture. And I'm going to give you a few seconds here. Take a quick look and see how many different animals you can count in this photo. Okay, so let's take a look here. This is a large river ecosystem. So we're not just talking fish, we're talking insects, we're talking turtles, we're talking birds, we're talking more birds, and of course, we're talking other animals like crayfish, and even freshwater mussels. We've got some little fish here off to the right. And then again, we got a dragonfly right here. All these animals are part of this ecosystem. And that is the reason that I like to go fishing and I still do. And that's the reason I became a zoologist and naturalist because when I was out fishing, I wasn't just catching fish. In fact, there was a lot of days I wouldn't catch anything, but I got to be out in nature and see exactly what you're seeing in the picture minus the underwater view because i don't have superpowers so i can't see what's going on under the water even with good sunglasses it's still pretty hard but i would see birds i would see insects i would see reptiles and of course i would catch fish if i was lucky and that's the big reason why fishing made such a big impact on me it wasn't catching the fish it was being outside in nature and experience the biodiversity OK, now these pictures obviously were not taken in Illinois, but this was actually a trip to the Everglades I took several years ago. And it was a fishing trip. But on that trip, I didn't catch many fish, but I saw all sorts of crazy wildlife. And I'm going to show you a few pictures here in the next couple of slides. Now, like I said before, catching fish when you're out fishing is just a cherry on top. This little snapper that I caught out of a kayak was one of the only fish I caught on my whole trip. However, I got to see a lot of wildlife that I wouldn't have been able to see if I wouldn't have gone down to the Everglades for a visit. And that includes roseate spoonbills, really neat type of bird, and American crocodiles. And this picture doesn't illustrate it, but I got a little bit too close to this animal. And in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have got a picture that close. Um, this was a very big reptile. And luckily, she was she was asleep mostly when I took the picture. But you could see by her eyes, she was just waking up. But again, I took these pictures while I was out fishing. And if I wasn't out there fishing, I would have never been able to see any of this. You also have beautiful pictures like this and experiences like this that you wouldn't get sitting inside behind a computer screen or just being inside doing whatever. Just being outside in general is very good. It's good for your health. It's good for your mental well-being. And of course, it's good for your spirit as well. And this is one of my favorite pictures that I ever took uh, out fishing. And this was down in the Everglades. Now, if we're talking closer to home here in the Chicagoland area, Illinois, don't think that seeing all sorts of animals is something that you can do only in a warm location like Florida or in an exotic location like somewhere overseas or in a different country. You can do it right here in an urban environment as well. In fact, all of these photos I took not even 20 minutes outside of Chicago. Uh, the pelicans actually were on one of the large rivers, and I can't recall which one, but... Um, we do have some turtles here basking on a log, and then we've got a little muskrat here looking to build possibly a den carrying some vegetation in its mouth. But again, I can't stress enough, you will never get to see any of this stuff if you spend time inside. You have to get outside and you have to experience that. And for me, fishing was a gateway into that, and it still is to this day. So, a couple fun facts here about Illinois for my Illinois viewers. Illinois actually has over 200 species of fish. 
we have over a million and a half surface acres of water here in the state. And there's over 1 million anglers that fish in the state every single year. Now let's break these down a bit. These are some of the Illinois waters that we have here in the state. This one might be very familiar to many of you. This is Lake Michigan, again, downtown Chicago with the skyline. But we also have many large rivers in the state. We have the Mississippi, and of course we have the Illinois, but we also have several other rivers, including the Kankakee and Rock River, and also the Ohio River down in Southern Illinois as well. We also have many creeks and streams that run throughout the state. And we have a lot of large reservoirs, which are blocked off by dams. This is actually Lake Shelbyville in central Illinois. We also have over 200 species of fish here in the state, including some of the largest fish here in North America. The one right here on the top left is called a muskie or a muskellunge. We also have flathead catfish, which can get over 100 pounds. And then we also have in Lake Michigan, a couple different species of cold water fish, including salmon. This is a Chinook or a King salmon, and those can get over 40 pounds. Now, how much water is in Illinois? Well, just to give you an idea, we have more surface water in the state than the size of Rhode Island. And if we want to go a bit bigger, the countries of Trinidad and Tobago, or Tobago, we have more water than that state and that country as a whole. There's a lot of water in the state, and there are a lot of aquatic resources that utilize that water, not just fish. We also have, again, big flathead catfish. We have sturgeon, which are prehistoric fish. And then we also have a couple species of gar, and they have a very long bony jaws, really, really neat fish. This is a, called a long nose gar, and this one was about five feet long. About two and a half feet of that was just its jaws. We also have a lot of small fish that live here in Illinois. This is an orange spotted sunfish, very pretty fish. We also have this, which is called a top minnow. And then we have a pygmy sunfish, very, very small type of fish. And these are found down in Southern Illinois. But like I mentioned before, Illinois is actually home to over 200 species of fish. And one of my favorites, and I think a lot of people's favorites for obvious reasons, this is called a rainbow darter. It's a small stream fish, very, very pretty colors, especially when they're looking for a, a girlfriend during breeding season. Their colors really, really get bright. So what I want to talk about uh, for the next few minutes here are fisheries fundamentals. And like I mentioned before, this is not something that is just for Illinois. A lot of states utilize these same methods and a lot of countries do as well. This isn't just us, but as far as Illinois goes, we do have a mission here in our fisheries division. And our mission is to conserve and enhance the state's fisheries and aquatic resources. We do that to provide a diversity of quality angling opportunities while maintaining and restoring the populations of native and non-native species of fish. And I'm going to tell you how we do that. So these are some of the methods that we use. Now, I do want to mention if there's any fisheries professionals, I know a couple of my coworkers might be listening or maybe some other people. This is the bare minimum. I'm just going over the basics here. There is a lot more that we do, uh, but we have limited time. So I decided to keep it pretty basic just to give you an idea of how we actually manage these resources. So these are some of the ways that we actually monitor uh, and maintain our resources, our aquatic resources, okay? And that includes everything from monitoring life cycles of fish to stocking fish and actually raising fish to put into lakes for people to catch. And what I do as well, which is educating the public and anglers about the resources through outreach and education, just like the talk that I'm participating in right now. A lot of this that we do is done by our fisheries technicians and our biologists. And they have several different roles in the state in managing our fisheries. They don't just hold big fish like this for photos, although there are a lot of good photos of our biologists holding very big fish from Illinois. Uh, these are just a few of them, but they do a lot more than that as well. So in this slide, you can see 
that there are several things that our fisheries biologists and technicians are doing. Here on the left, they are pulling a net. Uh, they're actually collecting fish that we can take eggs out of. More on that in a minute. Up here, they're actually marking fish before they release them. Uh, and we can do that several ways. One way is actually clipping off one of their fins with a pair of shears or scissors. Doesn't hurt the fish, but it allows us to identify them if we catch them at a later time. And then, of course, here again, two of our biologists posing for some more pictures with some nice musky uh, that were caught in central Illinois. But what do our biologists actually do as far as fisheries go? So they monitor they survey and they manage aquatic species and the habitats that they live in. So that's the lakes, ponds, and rivers. And they report changes in the water bodies as well. Or they make suggestions on how to make that body of water more diverse or healthier. And there's a few ways we can do that. And again, this is just the bare minimum here. There's a lot more that we do but I do wanna show you some of the methods that our biologists use to actually manage our fisheries here in the state. One of the things that they do are net surveys where they will set out nets to collect fish. Uh, this one actually, you can see there is a big basket at the end of this net and it runs up to the shore. And what happens with these nets is the fish hit this wall of mesh and you can see the little floats holding the line up they hit the wall, they swim up, and they get caught in this collection basket. And then we can pull those nets and do surveys of the lakes or the rivers that we're doing these surveys on. So we're actually looking at what kind of fish we're catching, the size of the fish, and also the different species of fish that we're catching as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Another thing that they can do is tagging fish. And that allows us to not only track the movement, but also the growth rate of the fish. And that can be done several different ways. Uh, one way is by these little tags here on the left. These are called pit tags. And they're very similar to tags that are put into dogs and cats, like a microchip for tracking. And we can insert those right into the fish. And those stay in the fish basically for life. And what we can do is we can actually run a special tool over that tag, again, just like you would use a microchip on a dog or a cat, and that will give us data on that fish, including the last time it was actually captured. Another type of tag that our biologists can use is called a floy tag or a spaghetti tag, and that actually goes into the back of the fish here, and it has a series of numbers and letters on it, and a lot of times these tags also have a phone number that you can call the biologist who's studying that lake and you can call them and give them data about the fish that you caught. So that's another way we can manage fisheries. Another way, and I wish I had a video for this, but I tried not to use any videos to make sure nothing broke during the presentation, is called electrofishing. And the way we do that is we actually use these boats with these big hoops on the front and they have wires hanging down in the water. And what happens is a current of electricity goes into the water and fish will get stunned by that current and float up to the surface. Sometimes they'll jump like you see in the middle picture here and we can net those fish and bring them into the boat to weigh them, measure them and look at their overall health. So that's another method that our biologists can use to study different bodies of water. And they usually do that in the summer and sometimes the fall months. Another thing that they can do is aging fish. This is actually a picture of what's called an otolith, which is an ear bone inside the fish. And just like rings on a tree, you can actually count how old the fish is by counting the rings on that otolith. So you can see there's several in this photo but you don't just have to use the ear bones from the fish to do that. You can actually use their spines as well. Uh, we have a fish here in Illinois called the catfish, and you can actually take their spine and cut off a section, and you can age them using that as well. Another way that our biologists and our staff manage the fisheries is by removing invasive species. Uh, many of you may have heard about the Asian carp before, 
and that is a very slimy big fish uh, that likes to jump out of the water. They are not native. They're what's known as an invasive species, and they came actually from overseas, and they've been making their way up to the northern states uh, for many decades now. They're in our large rivers here in the state, and there are a lot of them. And one of the things that our staff does is manage these species to ensure that they actually don't take over our fisheries or they don't spread any farther than they've already gone. Uh, and they don't do that with just carp. They do that with a lot of different species as well. But these pictures right here are all of the invasive or Asian carp. And those are a big problem throughout the U.S. So it's not just our state working on that. It's actually several states uh, working on that problem. Another thing that our biologists do is reporting. We have a website, if anybody's interested, it's called iFish Illinois, and that has reports on all the public bodies of water here in the state. And it'll tell you not only what fish are being stocked or put into those bodies of water, but also how the actual fishery is, uh, or the status of the fishery as we call it. And you can see here, there's a couple different fish listed here. And it'll tell you if the fishery is good, excellent, very good, or hopefully it's not poor, but not all fisheries are the best fisheries. And that's, again, one of the reasons why we need to manage them in order to make them better. But that's a big part of what our biologists do as well is reporting and data collection. Now, something else we do is fish stocking. And that is done by our fish hatcheries. And Illinois has three fish hatcheries, and those hatcheries actually produce 15 different types of fish. And we stock into waters here in Illinois over 20 million fish every single year. Now, when those fish start off at the hatchery, usually they will come in as eggs. And these are some salmon eggs that are getting ready to hatch. If you look closely at this picture, you can actually see that there are little dots here in the egg. And those are actually baby fish, in this case, salmon, getting ready to come out of the egg. And like I said, our hatcheries do over 20 million fish a year. Now, there's a couple thousand eggs in this picture. That's a very small percentage of the fish we put into the lakes, ponds, and rivers here every single year. After they hatch, you get these little guys, and we actually have two different species here. Uh, this is a little bass, and I believe this little bass is only about five or six days old in this picture. And then <clears throat> on this side, we have a little trout, uh, and this trout is probably about a month old. Now, we do have a couple different hatcheries here in the state, and I'm just going to go through these really briefly. We have LaSalle Fish Hatchery, which is in central Illinois, and they actually are our smallest fish hatchery, but they actually produce the most fish here in the state. Uh, they actually produce over 10 million fish a year, and on the left-hand side, you can see these jars right here. These are actually where they hatch out the eggs. In this case, they're actually hatching out this little fish right here. And this is a very popular fish that people like to catch in Illinois. And this is called a walleye. Now this is a very small walleye, but you can find those in a lot of our rivers throughout the state. Very popular game fish and very tasty too, if you like eating fish. We also have little grassy fish hatchery, which is down in Southern Illinois. And they are the ones that produce the catfish for the state. So. These are little baby catfish, and they almost look transparent when they're that small, but you can definitely tell that they're a catfish because if you look on the side of their heads, you can see their little whiskers. Now, we also have Jake Wolf Memorial Fish Hatchery, which is where I used to work before I got the job that I'm in now, and this is our largest fish hatchery in Illinois. And Jake Wolf produces all kinds of fish, including the salmon and trout that I showed you a bit earlier, but they also produce some very large predatory fish. And that includes muskie, which are these fish on the right here, and alligator gar, 
which are our largest native fish here in Illinois. In fact, these alligator gar are able to get to lengths of over 12 feet long, and they can weigh a few hundred pounds. They're living dinosaurs, and Jake Wolf is the place where we raise those. And why do we have fish hatcheries as part of our fisheries management? Well, we have fish hatcheries to enhance our fishing opportunities. We also do it to supplement or basically boost existing populations of fish. And then we also do it to conserve species like those alligator gar that I just showed you. Still very rare in the state, but we are slowly reintroducing them back into the state. Fish hatcheries and fisheries teams throughout the country don't just work with fish. We also work with other aquatic organisms, too. Uh, when I worked at Jake Wolf a few years ago, we raised freshwater mussels. Some people call these clams. Uh, they are similar, but different. And then we also have endangered dragonflies that we raised as well. What's really exciting is that we also reintroduced many rare and endangered species working with fisheries. Uh, we've not only enhanced habitat for them, but we've actually raised them at hatcheries to reintroduce into the wild. And that includes the alligator gar. And these are little baby gar that we actually released last summer. And this is what they turn into. Again, living dinosaurs, our largest native species of fish, over 12 feet long, or capable of sizes over 12 feet long, and weights of a few hundred pounds. Really, really neat fish. Don't worry, they're not dangerous. They actually serve a very important role in the ecosystem, and they act as both predator and prey in the areas that they're found in. But really, really big and really, really powerful fish. We also raised another prehistoric fish last year, and that is lake sturgeon. Now, sturgeon are another prehistoric fish. This is a very small one. This one is only about two months old in this photo, but we did release them and fully grown. These fish can get up to about eight feet long and some sturgeon have been known to live over 150 years. So they are a very long lived, very ancient fish. And we actually reintroduced them here into Illinois uh, for the first time in about 20 years. And we did that last year. And I got to be a part of that. It was really, really exciting. And they are just a very fun little fish to work with. Now, to wrap up here, before we go to questions, another very important part of managing our fisheries is outreach and education. And we do that throughout the state all year long, in fact, the program that I'm part of, the Urban Fishing Program here in Illinois, we educate about 100,000 people in Illinois every single year, and we take them fishing through free fishing clinics and big events like the Two Rivers Family Fair, which is down in Southern Illinois. That's actually one of my coworkers that runs that, and he has about 400 volunteers that help him run that event. And he teaches thousands of people about the outdoors every single year at this event through fishing seminars, hunting seminars, and other outdoor activities. Now, what we're part of and what I'm part of is actually the Illinois Urban or Community Fishing Program. And that's been around for almost 40 years now. And what we do is we actually take people fishing uh, through free fishing clinics. I also do school visits and presentations about aquatic resources, sort of like I'm doing right now. And then we also do special events throughout the state. And as I mentioned before, we educate about 100,000 people a year. So it's a pretty big program and it's a lot of fun to do because you get to travel all over and you get to teach people about the resources here in Illinois, just like I'm teaching you about today. These are some of the program offerings that we have. So like I said, we do fishing clinics. We do casting clinics where we actually cast even when there's places that don't have water, like a library or maybe a city park. And then we also do fish identification, knot tying, and we talk about ethical angling as well. And that is really what I kind of want to wrap up on before we get to questions is none of these resources would be possible without ethical angling. And what I mean by that is when you're out there fishing, 
regardless of where you're at or what kind of fish you're trying to catch, you should always follow these practices. And again, there's a lot more than this, but these ones are extremely important to ensure that we're maintaining and protecting our aquatic resources. And that is know your rules and regulations, practice CPR, leave no trace. If we have any scouts listening, you should be very familiar with that. And that basically just means clean up after yourself and leave the resource as you found it. Don't release your pets or live bait into the wild. Share your knowledge with others and respect the resources. Every year we come out with fishing regulations and these have rules and regulations for all the different bodies of water in the state. They are effective for a year. So we do come out with new copies every single year. And these will tell you how many fish you can catch at a lake, how many fish you can keep if you're taking anything home to eat and size limits as well, meaning that if a fish is a certain size, you can actually keep it and take it home. But if it's smaller than that, you will actually have to throw it back. So these regulations are very good to have. Uh, they're available at sporting goods stores throughout the state, like Walmart and Bass Pro. And then they're also available online as well. And you can get these and look through them. And there's some great pictures in these as well, including our sturgeon friend here, which was actually taken at the fish hatchery a couple years ago. Another thing that good anglers or ethical anglers should practice is catch photo release. So you should actually take photos of your fish and release it back into the wild if you do not plan on keeping it. And again, those are there are those rules and regulations to follow. So make sure that you are following those uh, if you do plan on keeping a fish. But otherwise, catch a fish, take a picture, and release it, just like this young man is doing with this beautiful muskie right here. Another thing is leave no trace. And that just means cleaning up after yourself when you are done fishing. And I wanted to show two things in this slide. One is a lot of sites have what's called line traps, which is where you can recycle your fishing line if you see it on the shore. And that ensures animals like birds and turtles don't get tangled up in fishing line that people leave behind. You can put it in these containers for recycling. Uh, and actually, there's a lot of organizations that will give you free trash bags and organize cleanups at your local ponds, lakes, and rivers. This is actually a cleanup I participated in many years ago here on the left, and that is all from one day out of a river right outside of Chicago. And that is a lot of trash, but that's trash that's not going to go into the river and hurt the wildlife. So it's very important to clean up after yourself and you can even clean up after others. In fact, we encourage that to make the resources even better than they were when you arrived. Another thing is don't release your pets uh, or bait, and that includes minnows and crayfish. Now, this is a goldfish that was caught out of a lake here in Illinois, and you can see this looks much, much bigger than a goldfish you would have in a little fishbowl or aquarium at home. And this is how big they can get if you release them into the wild. They can actually get even bigger than this. And this is a way we stop invasive species or alien species, animals that don't belong in our native environments. This is one of the ways we stop them from spreading is by not releasing bait and pets. So don't do that if you're ever out fishing or if you want to get rid of something like a turtle, go through a local rescue and don't just throw it in a lake or a pond. Another thing to do is share your knowledge. These are also urban fishing instructors. They're actually in central Illinois. Uh, these are some of my coworkers and very good at what they do. So if you're ever down at the state fair here in Illinois, you might run into some of these folks and they'll teach you all about fishing. And fishing, you have to remember, is fun and accessible. One of the reasons I've done it for so long is because people of any age, skill level, and ability can go out and fish. You can be old, you can be young, you can be any religion, ethnicity, it doesn't matter. Anybody can go fishing. And that is one of the great things about the hobby and the sport is you can go out right now if you wanted to and go fishing. Uh, and the great thing about the students listening in is as long as you're under 16 in Illinois, you don't even need a fishing license to go out and fish. So you can do it for free. 
but fishing is fun and it's accessible. And that's one of the reasons I've been doing it for over 30 years is because anybody can do it. And you do get to meet a lot of great people and make a lot of friends when you're out fishing. So that being said, go out fishing whenever you get a chance. It's not only fun to do, it will teach you about the environment and not just the fish. It'll teach you about all the other animals that live in the environment as well. Because if you remember that picture I showed earlier of the large river, there's not only fish in these bodies of water. There's birds, there's turtles, there's crayfish. There is all sorts of wildlife. And if you're not out by the lake or the pond, you're not going to experience that. And that's why I encourage everybody who's listening, their friends, their family, and anybody that you know, go out and go fishing. It is a lot of fun. It's healthy. And it is one of the best hobbies that you can pick up. And I'm not just saying that because I did it for a long time. I truly believe that. And I wouldn't be able to do anything that I've done in my career if it wasn't for fishing. Again, this is where it all started over 30 years ago. And if I didn't have that pole in my hand, I wouldn't have done anything that I've been able to do in my career. If you want to learn more, these are some websites that you can visit. Uh, I Fish Illinois is our fisheries website here in Illinois. Take Me Fishing will also teach you about some fishing methods and some basic skills. You can learn more about how to uh, how to prevent the spread of invasive species through be a hero, transport zero. You can go to our main website to learn more about what we do as an agency. And then you can also go here if you're over 16 years old and you want to buy a fishing license. That's Explore More Illinois. With that, I want to thank everybody for attending today. And I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Okay, so the first question is, um, what safety measures measures should beginner anglers know before they start fishing? That is a great question. Um, there are several. I'm going to try to keep my answers brief because I know I, I'm looking at the chat and there's a lot of questions. Um, I would say, first things first, uh, practice casting and get familiar with holding a fishing rod because there's a couple parts on a rod uh, and tackle that can actually uh, hurt you, including the hook and the tip of the rod. So practice your casting and always be aware of who's around you when you're fishing and what things are around you or objects, whether it be a tree, maybe rocks, um, again, animals, anything like that. You want to make sure that you're aware of your surroundings when you're fishing so you don't hook yourself or hook somebody else. I would say be patient. Uh, don't be in a hurry, especially when you're down by the water because you don't want to slip and fall in. We do recommend everybody carrying safety devices, whether it be a life jacket or anything like that. And of course, make sure to bring the proper resources with you when you're fishing, whether that be sunscreen, bug spray, or uh, again, just proper clothing when you're out fishing in the elements. So those are some very good rules to follow just to begin with. All right, so the next question is, what are the effects of dam removals on the ecosystem and habitat? Yeah, so I'm just going to touch briefly on that because, again, I know we have a lot of questions. But uh, what they found when dams are removed is that rivers will actually return to a more natural state. And without that barrier in place, what you're seeing is actually more species going above and below those old dam sites and being able to utilize habitat that was blocked off from them in the past. That's also allowing species like sturgeon uh, who travel a long way when they're spawning to actually get to spawning sites they might not have been able to access for many, many decades. So yeah, dam removals are very popular now in the US and they are gonna continue. Uh, they do really improve a lot of these uh, flowing type of, uh, type of water bodies like rivers and streams. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question is, how do the different types of habitats within the ecosystem affect the fish's physical attributes? I, I'm sorry, say that one more time. Um, how do the different types of habitats within the ecosystem affect the fish's physical attributes? Yeah, so just like uh, just like other animals, over the generations, fish do adapt different adaptations or evolve different adaptations 
to utilize. Uh, we actually have an invasive species of fish here in Illinois called the round goby, and they're a bottom dwelling fish. Uh, they're actually invasive, but they have a really cool adaptation. It's actually a fin on the bottom of their body, and it's shaped like a suction cup. And that actually allows them to adhere to hard surfaces. Uh, they also have a very uh, brownish yellow color pattern, and that allows them to blend into the bottom that they like. And they can actually change color as well to match their surrounding. And there's a lot of fish that can do that. So yeah, there's just like any other animals, fish can definitely evolve different adaptations uh, and even change color in cases to match their surroundings. That's a great question. All right, so the next one is, what are some sustainable fishing practices anglers should know? Sustainable fishing practices, yeah. Uh, so again, that goes back to catch and release. If you're not going to take something home to eat it, definitely release it so it can either reproduce out in the wild or it can get to a bigger size and actually act as either predator or prey for other fish or other organisms in that system. And then, of course... Uh, don't keep over your limit as well. And that's just, you know, that's common sense because one, you don't want to take more fish than you're actually going to eat or use. And two, uh, if you do that, you're actually breaking the law and you can get a big ticket or a fine. Uh, so you don't want to do that either. But yeah, we definitely promote catch and release where we can. Uh, but there are those size limits in place if you do want to take fish home and eat them. But that's one of the most important things. If you're not going to eat something, release it back so either somebody else can catch it or it can continue to live out in the wild. Okay, so the next question is, do you ever use volunteers to help with your surveys? Uh, in, in cases, yes, we do. And actually, it's pretty cool um, in our field. A lot of a lot of times we'll get seasonal workers that are college students. Uh, and that's actually how they start their careers is going out in the boats with the biologists and helping with those surveys. But we also have volunteers help us with fish rescues uh, and other efforts as well. And we also have summer interns uh, that help us with a lot of these projects. So yeah, there's there's a lot of volunteers. Um, and even with our fishing program where we take the kids fishing, we have a lot of volunteers that come and help us to teach those fishing clinics as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next question is, what are some ethical issues associated with anglers that we should be aware of? Ooh, um, I, you know, I think one of the biggest things is just uh, poaching. You know, again, people taking more than they're using. And that's, you know, you could say that for hunters as well. Um, a big issue we see here in Chicago and other urban areas is people not cleaning up after themselves. Um, you know, they leave line, they leave bait containers, and they basically leave garbage. Uh, if anybody here has been to a forest preserve or a campsite, and it doesn't have to be here in Illinois, it could be anywhere, uh, even beaches uh, in the, you know, on the ocean or the Great Lakes, you almost always see garbage. And that's one of the biggest issues is there's just a lot of people that don't clean up after themselves. Uh, and they're not a good representation of what an angler should be. Again, that goes back to ethical angling. You should always leave no trace. You should always clean up after yourself. That's one of the big issues along with poaching. Um, and of course, introducing invasive species, but that's a whole different conversation for another time. <laughs> All right, so the next question is, can people visit the Illinois hatcheries? Absolutely. Yeah, actually, uh, where I used to work, Jake Wolf, they offer public tours. Uh, it's called Jake Wolf Memorial Fish Hatchery. They're about three hours south of Chicago. And then LaSalle offers tours during the spring. Uh, they're about an hour and a half outside Chicago. And then Little Grassy is way down Southern Illinois and they do public tours throughout the year as well. Uh, and they're all free of charge. Just call the hatchery and uh, you can even let them know that Frank sent you. So <laughs> the next one is, are the hatcheries funded by the government? And if so, how many tax dollars go to raising fish for the wild? Yeah. So actually what a lot of people don't know is uh, most of our funding actually comes from the anglers. So if you buy your fishing license in the state, that's going right back to our operations. So all the photos and everything you saw today, that's going right back to us. Uh, so that's funding us. Now we do get some federal money as well, but a lot of that that we're using here in the state is coming from fishing license sales. So it's very important if you're 16 or older to buy your fishing license. Uh, but yes, we do get federal money as well. 
But when people complain about uh, the tax dollars not going to certain things, it's actually the fishing license sales are going right back to our fisheries division. Another great question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question is, do you have a favorite type of fish in general, and do you have a favorite type of fish to eat? Oh, another good question. Uh, well, if you didn't hear it during my presentation, I'm a huge fan of gar. Uh, they're a prehistoric fish. They get really big. They have a bad reputation, unfortunately. Uh, some people think they're bad for the environment, and that's not the case. Um, I worked with them for several years, and they're very laid back fish. I know it looks like they have a lot of teeth. Uh, let me see if I could go back here and find my gar photo. Um, let's see. Here we go. Yeah, so you would think that these are big, aggressive fish, but they're they're basically like logs with fins. Um they do hunt and eat other fish, but if you look at their mouths, their mouths are actually quite small for their body size. Uh, people think that they eat people and eat pets and all that. That's actually one of the reasons um, that they became endangered in a lot of states. In addition to habitat loss and uh, rivers were also channeled, so habitat was lost and altered. But people also would kill these a lot just because they look big and scary. But I could tell you firsthand from working with them, uh, they're one of the coolest fish. And they can breathe air, which is awesome, too. So uh, as far as eating fish, I really like to eat perch. Yeah, yellow perch out of Lake Michigan. The next question is, what issues will arise from overfishing keystone species? Yeah, so another good question. Just like any other ecosystem, the more you take out... Uh, of a keystone species or a top predator, really anything. I mean, when people think of food chains, they think of a straight chain. But really, if you talk about an ecosystem, uh, for example, one of our large rivers here in Illinois might have over 100 species of fish. You're not talking about a chain. You're talking about a web, like a spider web. So anything you take out is going to weaken that web and weaken the entire structure but when you're taking out some of those apex predators or those keystone species that really influence other populations, uh, you can definitely see imbalance in the system. But that's one of the reasons that fisheries divisions exist is to help maintain those populations and make recommendations on how to keep them balanced by putting these rules and regulations in place. And that includes everything I've been talking about, the size limits, the harvest limits, uh, and also reintroducing these species to control other species as well. Uh, alligator gar are a good example of that. They're a native fish to Illinois, uh, and they do help eat other fish in a population, uh, and that includes bait fish. Uh, and they've even been known to eat those invasive or Asian carp I mentioned earlier as well. So yeah, just like any ecosystem, you don't want to you don't want to take out too many of those keystone species. And that's where proper management comes into play. So these are great questions. <laughs> so the next question is, what are some potential consequences of, a, of illegal fishing practices? Uh, yeah. So that's, again, poaching. You're taking out too much of the resource. Another issue, and we don't see this that much in Illinois because we're freshwater, but in ocean environments, you see a lot of nets that are left. Uh, wildlife gets caught in those nets, and that's not good. Uh, there's a lot of other fishing gear that just gets abandoned, and wildlife gets stuck in that. Uh, I do want to make a distinction, though, or, or show the difference here, or explain the difference. That's commercial fishing. What I was talking about today is recreational fishing. So that's when one or two people go out, or a small group of people. That's not like the big boats out in the ocean that are hauling, you know, tons and tons of fish in every day, that's commercial fishing. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely different impacts to the ecosystem uh, from illegal fishing. A big one is just abandoned gear and poaching. So, and of course, and of course you're affecting endangered species as well. Uh, some of these endangered species go for a lot of money on the market um, and people, you know, people want to make that money uh, and they they really don't care if a species goes extinct. Um, and that's not being an ethical angler, you know. All right. So the next question is, as you do programs around the area, have you noticed any changes in the quality of the waterways? Yeah, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um 
In fact, a lot of these urban areas were seeing improved water quality and we're actually seeing improved species count. Uh, we have another coordinator that manages Chicago and the Chicago River, especially, they've been seeing a ton of fish uh, coming back or being found in that river. And even a river by my house, as soon as they took that dam down, you were seeing a lot of species that we normally didn't see coming back uh, into the system because they were able to move around where that dam once was. So yeah, we are seeing improved water quality in a lot of these areas, uh, and hopefully that continues to improve. Uh, but again, fisheries management isn't something that just stops. It's something you have to do constantly to make sure that everything stays in balance and the system stays healthy. Um, so the next question is, if you were to catch a fish, how would you determine its age? Yeah. So uh, one of the best ways, I mean, size is one way, but fish grow at different rates. Uh, really one of the most uh, or successful methods or proven methods is to actually count the rings in the ear bone. Um, but in that case, you are harvesting the fish, meaning you are actually having the to uh, kill the fish. But with catfish, it's cool because you can actually pop one of their spines out to age them. There is a method to do that. I don't recommend anybody trying it because they can poke you. But um, those are the most reliable ways to age them is those otoliths and those spines. Um, and then you can actually see growth rings on their scales as well. Okay. The next question is how has the perspective of fishing changed over time? Um. You know, you know, fishing nowadays, I think, is more of a hobby and recreation versus decades ago and hundreds of years, and if not thousands of years ago, fishing was for survival. You were fishing because you needed something to eat. Uh, it was your livelihood. You know, Native American tribes were making tools out of fish parts. Um, they were sustaining themselves off of these fish that they were catching. Nowadays, it's more about recreation uh, and it's just going outside and experiencing nature and also just going outside to go fishing. Uh, you see a lot of fishing channels on YouTube and other social media, and you see a lot of people going out to catch fish in these far off locations. But I also think nowadays conservation is a lot more important to the bigger picture. Uh, years ago, it was just fish, 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 catch the fish, eat the fish. And now it's, well, how can we make sure these fish are around for generations to come? And that's where the management and the conservation comes in. So I think those are some of the big changes that occurred. All right. And then we do have eight more questions. So we're just wondering if you'd be okay with going over or... I can either, if if the students are attending another session, um, I totally understand uh, if I'm fine with going over and if they are leaving, uh, I can always answer questions via email. But yeah, I'm happy sticking around for a few minutes. Okay, okay. then we'll go ahead and continue. Okay, so sure. question is, how does weather conditions and water temperature affect angler fishing? Would it increase or decrease the amount of fish they catch? Yeah. Uh, a lot of times that depends on the species because earlier I mentioned there's a couple different types of fish. There's warm, cool, and cold water. And when I say that, I'm referring to the water temperature that those fish like. Uh, so I always compare it to like Goldilocks and the three bears. So, you know, some some fish like it hot, some fish like it cold, some fish like it just right. Uh, those gar I showed you earlier, they're a warm water fish. So what's kind of cool with them is that in the summertime, they're really active and they're very noticeable. But in the winter and colder months, you don't really see them a lot. So a lot of these lakes where people see something like a gar, well, they think that all the other fish have either died or just they're not there anymore because all they see is gar in the summer. But that's not the case. What happened is these other fish got too hot and they went to deeper water to cool off. Um, but on the flip side of that, you have something like a salmon here in Lake Michigan. They're a cold water fish. So if the water's not in the 50s, uh, they're out in the deep water of the lake and they're trying to find that cold water. They don't like warm water. So it really depends on the type of fish. Uh, but other conditions like cold fronts, uh, storms, and even wind direction all affect fish behavior. But it really depends on the species of fish. Uh, so that's that's a very long question to answer. But yeah, a lot of it boils down to what type of fish it is. 
um, and also just their habitat preferences as well. So. Okay, the next question is, what's the biggest sturgeon you've seen? <laughs> uh, oh, man. Well, if, if we're counting the ones that I worked with, uh, about six inches. But if we're counting ones that I've seen at zoos and aquariums and actually seen out in the wild, uh, the biggest one I saw was, I believe, about five feet. And there are sturgeon here in the U.S. that can actually get much larger than that. There's a sturgeon out on the West Coast called the white sturgeon, and they can actually get over 2,000 pounds. Uh, but the biggest one that I've seen is, yeah, just a couple inches, and that was one of the ones we raised at the fish hatchery. But that's for work. Outside of work, I've seen them much bigger. Okay, so the next question is, do you have any recommendations as to how to cook a fish after you've caught it? <laughs> oh man, I like to cook. Um, there's a lot of ways, but I mean, you can't go wrong. There's an old saying, uh, you dip them in a cornmeal jacket and you fry them up in oil. Um, fried fish, especially fish like bluegill and perch and catfish, very tasty, just fried up in cornmeal or a flour mix. Uh, another way, if you're going to be a bit healthier is you can take them in tin foil, uh, with some lemon and butter and some herbs, and you basically bake, bake them in the oven. Uh, one of my favorite ways to do fish, if you like spicy food, is you coat them in a Cajun seasoning. You get a pan or a grill as hot as you can, and you hit them really quick on either side, and that's called blackening. Uh, and that's a Cajun thing. That's really good. But uh, yeah, nothing wrong with just frying them up in some hot oil. Like I said, put them in a cornmeal jacket. That's the old saying. <laughs> All right. The next question is, are there some locations that would yield better catch or bigger catches compared to other locations? Yeah. So one of the things about being a experienced angler is knowing what fish you're targeting and knowing what habitats they like. So a lot of times with fish, you're looking for logs, you're looking for rocks, you're looking for weeds that are in the water. Uh, again, that goes back to what we were just talking about of certain temperatures and preferences for fish. It's the same thing with habitat. If you know what fish like, then you'll have a better chance at catching them. And also, if you know what the fish are eating, that's always a good thing. There's an old saying in fishing called match the hatch. And what that means is you actually can take a net or a bucket or some other item and dip some of the water out of a lake or pond and look at what's living in there. And that'll tell you potentially what the fish are eating. Sometimes the fish make it easy. I've caught fish on Lake Michigan where you're reeling them in and they start burping up fish that they just ate. And at that point, you just, yeah, it's kind of gross. But, at you know, you scoop up the little fish that they're eating and go, huh, that's a little white fish. Well, I have a lure in my box that is little and white and you're matching the hatch. So again, that goes back to what I was saying is it depends on the type of fish. But yeah, if you know what you're fishing for and know what they're eating and know what habitats they like, you have a much better chance at catching them. Um, Lake Michigan is one of those lakes that's really hard to fish because it's so big. But if you look for certain things like a good wind, uh, if you look for the bait, which are the little fish, the bigger fish are eating. And sometimes you even just look for the birds that are diving down and eating that bait. If you see those things, chances are there's bigger fish around eating those little fish. So, yeah, it's just about knowing your environment um, and just being aware of that. So I think that's one of the reasons I was a naturalist for so many years is because when you're fishing, your powers of observation become very good and you learn how to observe the whole ecosystem, not just the fish that you're trying to catch. Okay. The next question is, what is the most pets you've had at one time? <laughs> I don't know if I want to answer that. Um, uh, if there was one point I did reptile rescue years ago. There was one point I had over 40 reptiles. Um, yeah. And then uh, if you include the bugs that I was keeping uh, that I would feed the reptiles, there was one point where I probably had about 15,000 animals in my house. Um, now, granted, that was the bugs that I was feeding a lot of the reptiles. So that includes the worms 
and the uh, like roaches and stuff that they would eat. But if we're counting not bugs, yeah, I think the most I ever had was like 40. Um, and that was way too much. Right now, I only have about 12. Uh, and I do have a bunny, too. I don't just have reptiles. I do have a rabbit, too. So. <laughs> All right. So the next question is, since different types of fish prefer different types of bait, how can you know what's the best bait to use? Match the hatch. Just what I was talking about. You look at what the fish are eating, or if you don't know what they're eating, you read books, you watch fishing shows, you talk to folks like me and other fishing instructors, and you learn what the fish are eating. Uh, some fish eat different types of food or prey at different types of year or different times a year. Like uh, there's a fish called a bass. And in the summertime, they like to eat frogs. And actually one of the best lures that you can fish for them in the summertime is a, a lure that sits on top of the water and it looks like a little frog. Uh, and it's actually really exciting because the bass will come up from underneath and they will just open these their giant mouths and they'll eat these plastic frogs. It's really, really cool. Uh, and you know, other times of the year, they might be eating small fish. They might be eating crayfish. So that goes back to match the hatch. If you study the fish and you study the lake or the pond, you can find out what they're eating and match your lure so you can catch more fish. Okay. So the next question is what's the weirdest bait you've ever had to use to catch a fish? <laughs> oh, weirdest bait. Um, oh man. I've caught a lot of fish. Um, one of the weirdest baits that actually works really well is actually chicken livers. Um, catfish like to eat them because they have a very strong smell. Uh, and they they just, they but they smell really, really funky, uh, especially if you don't put them in the fridge. Um, that's another thing for the young anglers out there. If you're using live bait like worms and fish, always make sure to refrigerate them after you're done. Because if you don't, uh, you get very, very smelly situations. And that's not fun. <laughs> uh, chicken livers. And then when I fished down in Florida, uh, we were fishing for these giant fish called Goliath grouper. And we were using uh, other fish for bait. And the fish we were using were like two feet long as bait. Um, but these grouper have mouths the size of a garbage can. So it looks like a big bait. But when you're fishing for the fish that are like 400 pounds and the size of a small car, um, you know, a, a two foot long fish isn't very big. So there's also a type of catfish bait that smells like funky cheese. Uh, and that's a bait that I used to use as a kid. Uh, I don't use that anymore because it makes your garage and your house smell like funky cheese. And that's no fun. <laughs> All right. So this one is our last question. And okay. It what is the best time of day to catch fish? A lot of times that depends on the fish, but you can't go wrong with sunup and sundown. Usually an hour before uh, sunup and an hour before and after sundown are some of the best times to catch fish. A lot of fish are sensitive to light uh, and they tend to feed more and are more active in the lower light conditions. So yeah, you can't go wrong with sunup and sundown. Thank you so much, Frank, for this presentation. And thank you so much again for staying over and answering all the questions that everybody had. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you so much. All right.